Now here is something that will stun and very likely outrage many who hear this. But there is documentary proof that our own Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton became students of Weishaupt's. Jefferson was one of Weishaupt's strongest defenders when he was outlawed by his government. And it was Jefferson who infiltrated the Illuminati into the then newly organized lodges of the Scottish Rite in New England. Here is the proof. In 1789, John Robeson warned all Masonic leaders in America that the Illuminati had infiltrated into their lodges. And on July 19, 1789, David Pappen, president of Harvard University, issued the same warning to the graduating class and lectured them on the influence Illuminism was acquiring on American politics and religion. And to top it off, John Quincy Adams, who had organized the New England Masonic Lodges, issued his warnings. He wrote three letters to Colonel William L. Stone, a top Mason, in which he exposed how Jefferson was using Masonic lodges for subversive, illuministic purposes. Those three letters are at this very time in Rittenberg Square Library in Philadelphia. In short, Jefferson, founder of the Democratic Party, was a member of the Illuminati, which at least partly accounts for the condition of the party at this time. And through infiltrations of the Republican Party, we have exactly nothing of loyal Americanism today. That disastrous rebuff at the Congress at Vienna, created by the Tsar of Russia, did not by any means destroy the Illuminati conspiracy. It merely forced them to adopt a new strategy, realizing that the one world idea was, for the moment, killed, the Rothschilds decided that to keep the plot alive, they'd have to do it by heightening their control of the money systems of the European nations. Earlier, by a ruse, the outcome of the Battle of Waterloo had been falsified. Rothschild had spread a story that Napoleon had won that battle. That had precipitated a terrific panic on the stock market in England. All stocks had plummeted down to practically zero and Nathan Rothschild bought all the stocks for virtually a penny on its dollar values. That gave him complete control of the economy of Britain and virtually of all Europe. So immediately after that Congress in Vienna had boomeranged, Rothschild forced Britain to set up a new Bank of England, which he absolutely controlled. Exactly as later, through Jacob Schiff, he engineered our own Federal Reserve Act, which gave the House of Rothschild a secret control of the economy in the United States. But now for a moment, let's dwell on the activities of the Illuminati in the United States. In 1826, one Captain William Morgan decided it was his duty to inform all Masons and the general public what the full truth was regarding the Illuminati their secret plans and intended objectives, also reveal the identities of the masterminds of the conspiracy. The Illuminati promptly tried Morgan in absentia and convicted him of treason. They ordered one Richard Howard, an English Illuminist, to carry out their sentence of execution as a traitor. Morgan was warned and he tried to escape to Canada but Howard caught up with him near the border, near the Niagara Gorge, to be exact, where he murdered him. This was verified in a sworn statement made in New York by one Avery Allen to the effect that he heard Howard render his report of the execution to a meeting of Knights Templars in St. John's Hall, New York. He also told how arrangements had been made to ship Howard back to England. That Allen affidavit is on record in New York City archives. Very few Masons and very few of the general public know that general disapproval over that incident of murder 
caused approximately half of all the Masons in the northern jurisdiction of the United States to secede. Copies of the minutes of the meeting held to discuss that matter are still in existence in safe hands, and that all that secrecy emphasizes the power of the masterminds of the Illuminati to prevent such terrible events of history from being taught in our schools. In the early 1850s, the Illuminati held a secret meeting in New York, which was addressed by a British Illuminist named Wright. Those in attendance were told that the Illuminati was organizing to unite the nihilist and atheist groups with all other subversive groups into an international to be known as communists. That was when the word communist first came into being, and it was intended to be the supreme weapon and scare word to terrify the whole world and drive the terrorized peoples into the Illuminati one world scheme. This scheme, communism, was to be used to enable the Illuminati to foment future wars and revolutions. Clinton Roosevelt, a direct ancestor of Franklin Roosevelt, Horace Greeley and Charles Dana, foremost newspaper publishers of that time, were appointed to head a committee to raise funds for the new venture. Of course, most of the funds were provided by the Rothschilds. And this fund was used to finance Karl Marx and Engels when they wrote Das Kapital and the Communist Manifesto in Soho, England. And this clearly reveals that communism is not a so-called ideology, but a secret weapon, a bogeyman word to serve the purpose of the Illuminati. Weishaupt died in 1830, but prior to his death, he prepared a revised version of the age-old conspiracy, the Illuminati, which under various aliases, was to organize, finance, direct, and control all international organizations and groups by working their agents into executive positions at the top. In the United States, we have Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, Jack Kennedy, Johnson, Rusk, McNamara, Fulbright, etc., as prime examples. In addition, while Karl Marx was writing the Communist Manifesto under the direction of one group of Illuminists, Professor Karl Ritter of Frankfurt University was writing the antithesis under direction of another group. The idea was that those who direct the overall conspiracy could use the differences in those two so-called ideologies to enable them to divide larger and larger members of the human race into opposing camps so that they could be armed and then brainwashed into fighting and destroying each other, and particularly to destroy all political and religious institutions. The work Ritter started was continued after his death and completed by the German so-called philosopher Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche, who founded Nietzscheism. This Nietzscheism was later developed into fascism and then into Nazism and was used to foment World Wars I and II. In 1834, the Italian revolutionary leader Giuseppe Mazzini was selected by the Illuminati to direct their revolutionary program throughout the world. He served in that capacity until he died in 1872. But some years before he died, Mazzini had enticed an American general named Albert Pike into the Illuminati. Pike was fascinated by the idea of a one-world government, and ultimately he became the head of this Luciferian conspiracy. Between 1859 and 1871, he, Pike, worked out a military blueprint for three world wars and various revolutions throughout the world, which he considered would forward the conspiracy to its final stage in the 20th century. Again, I remind that these conspirators were never concerned with immediate success, 
they always operated on a long-range view. Pike did most of his work in his home in Little Rock, Arkansas. But a few years later, when the Illuminati's lodges of the Grand Orient became suspect and repudiated because of Mazzini's revolutionary activities in Europe, Pike organized what he called the New and Reformed Palladian Rite. He set up three supreme councils, one in Charleston, South Carolina, one in Rome, Italy, and the third in Berlin, Germany. He had Mazzini establish 23 subordinate councils in strategic locations throughout the world. These have been the secret headquarters of the world revolutionary movement ever since. Long before Marconi invented radio, the scientists in the Illuminati had found the means for Pike and the heads of his councils to communicate secretly. It was the discovery of that secret that enabled intelligence officers to understand how apparently unrelated incidents, one such as the assassination of an Austrian prince at Sarajevo, took place simultaneously throughout the world, which developed into a war or a revolution. Pike's plan was as simple as it has proved effective. It called for communism, Nazism, political Zionism, and other international movements be organized and used to foment three global world wars and at least two major revolutions. The First World War was to be fought so as to enable the Illuminati to destroy Tsarism in Russia, as vowed by Rothschild after the Tsar had torpedoed his scheme at the Congress in Vienna, and to transform Russia into a stronghold of atheistic communism. The differences stirred up by agents of the Illuminati between the British and German empires were to be used to foment this war. After the war would be ended, communism was to be built up and used to destroy other governments and weaken religions. World War II, when and if necessary, was to be fomented by using the controversies between fascists and political Zionists. And here let it be noted that Hitler was financed by Krupp, the Warburgs, the Rothschilds, and other internationalist bankers, and that the slaughter of the supposed 600,000 Jews by Hitler didn't bother the Jewish internationalist bankers at all. That slaughter was necessary in order to create worldwide hatred of the German people and thus bring about the war against them. In short, this Second World War was to be fought to destroy Nazism and to increase the power of political Zionism so that the State of Israel could be established in Palestine. During this World War II, international communism was to be built up until it equaled in strength that of united Christendom. When it reached that point, it was to be contained and kept in check until required for the final social cataclysm. As we know now, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin put that exact policy into effect, and Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson continued that same exact policy. World War III is to be fomented by using the so-called controversies, the agents of the Illuminati, operating under whatever new name, are now stirring up between the political Zionists and the leaders of the Muslim world. That war is to be directed in such a manner that all of Islam and political Zionism, Israel, will destroy each other, while at the same time, the remaining nations, once more divided on this issue, will be forced to fight themselves into a state of complete exhaustion, physically, mentally, spiritually, and economically. Now, can any thinking person doubt that the intrigue now going on in the near, middle, and far east is designed to accomplish that satanic objective? Pike himself foretold all this in a statement he made to Mazzini on August 15, 1871, Pike stated that after World War III is ended, those who will inspire 
to undisputed world domination will provoke the greatest social cataclysm the world has ever known. Quoting his own words, taken from the letter he wrote to Mazzini, and which letter is now catalogued in the British Museum in London, England, he said, we shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a great social cataclysm which in all its horror will show clearly to all nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origin of savagery and of most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere, the people forced to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitudes disillusioned with Christianity whose deistic spirits will be from that moment on without direction and leadership and anxious for an ideal but without knowledge where to send its adoration will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer brought finally out into public view a manifestation which will result from a general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. When Mazzini died in 1872, Pike made another Italian revolutionary leader named Adrian Lemmy his successor. Lemmy, in turn, was succeeded by Lenin and Trotsky, then by Stalin. The revolutionary activities of all those men were financed by British, French, German, and American international bankers, all of them dominated by the House of Rothschild. We are supposed to believe that the international bankers of today, like the money changers of Christ's day, are only the tools or agents of the great conspiracy, but actually, they are the masterminds behind all of it. While the general public has been brainwashed by all the mass communications media into believing that communism is a movement of the so-called workers, the actual fact is that both British and American intelligence officers have authentic documentary evidence that international liberals operating through their international banking houses particularly the House of Rothschild, have financed both sides in every war and revolution since 1776. Those who today comprise the conspiracy, the CFR in the United States, direct our governments, whom they hold in usury through such methods as the Federal Reserve System in America, to fight wars such as Vietnam, created by the United Nations, so as to further Pike's Illuminati plans to bring the world to that stage of the conspiracy when atheistic communism and the whole of Christianity can be forced into an all-out Third World War within each remaining nation as well as on an international scale. The headquarters of the great conspiracy in the late 1700s was in Frankfurt, Germany, where the House of Rothschild had been established by Mayor Anselm, who adopted the Rothschild name and linked together other international financiers who had literally sold their souls to the devil. After the Bavarian government's exposure in 1786, the conspirators moved their headquarters to Switzerland, then to London. Since World War II, after Jacob Schiff, the Rothschild's boy in America, died, the headquarters of the American branch has been in the Harold Pratt Building, New York, and the Rockefellers, originally protégés of Schiff, have taken over the manipulation of finances in America for the Illuminati. In the final phases of the conspiracy, the one world government will consist of the king dictator, head of the United Nations, the CFR, and a few billionaires, economists, and scientists who have proved their devotion to the great conspiracy. All others are to be integrated into a vast conglomeration of mongrelized humanity, actually slaves. 
Now let me show you how our federal government and the American people have been sucked into the one world takeover plot of the Illuminati great conspiracy. And always bear in mind that the United Nations was created to become the housing for that one world so-called liberal conspiracy. The real foundations of the plot for the takeover of the United States were laid during the period of our Civil War. Not that Weishaupt and the earlier masterminds had ever overlooked the New World. As I have previously indicated, Weishaupt had his agents planted over here as far back as the Revolutionary War. But George Washington was more than a match for them. It was during the Civil War that the conspirators launched their first concrete efforts. We know that Judah Benjamin, chief advisor of Jefferson Davis, was a Rothschild agent. We also know that there were Rothschild agents planted in Abraham Lincoln's cabinet who tried to sell him into a financial dealing with the House of Rothschild. But old Abe saw through the scheme and bluntly rejected it thereby incurring the undying enmity of the Rothschilds, exactly as the Russian Tsar did when he torpedoed their first League of Nations at the Congress in Vienna. Investigation of the assassination of Lincoln revealed that the assassin, Booth, was a member of a secret conspiratorial group. Because there were a number of highly important government officials involved, the name of the group was never revealed, and it became a mystery, exactly as the assassination of Jack Kennedy still is a mystery. But I am sure it will not for long remain a mystery. Anyway, the ending of the Civil War destroyed, temporarily, all chances of the House of Rothschild to get a clutch on our money system such as they had acquired in Britain and other nations in Europe. I say temporarily because the Rothschilds and the masterminds of the conspiracy never quit. So they had to start from scratch, but they lost no time in getting started. Shortly after the Civil War, a young immigrant who called himself Jacob H. Schiff arrived in New York. Jacob was a young man with a mission for the House of Rothschild. Jacob was the son of a rabbi, born in one of Rothschild's houses in Frankfurt, Germany. I won't go deeply into his background. The important point is that Rothschild recognized in him not only a potential money wizard, but more important, he also saw the latent Machiavellian qualities in Jacob that could, as it did, make him an invaluable functionary in the great one world conspiracy. After a comparatively brief training period in the Rothschild's London Bank, Jacob left for America with instructions to buy into a banking house, which was to be the springboard to acquire control of the money system of the United States. Actually, Jacob came here to carry out four specific assignments. Number one, and most important, was to acquire control of America's money system. Number two, find desirable men who, for a price, would be willing to serve as stooges for the great conspiracy and promote them into high places in our federal government, our Congress, in the U.S. Supreme Court, and all federal agencies. Number three, create minority group strife throughout the nations, particularly between whites and blacks. Number four, create a movement to destroy religion in the United States, but Christianity to be the chief target.